I am most grateful to uh, Mandaban Parikh and to the Indian Society for Community Education for inviting me to deliver the 14th Ramlal Parikh Memorial Lecture. I, several eminent individuals have given this lecture in the past and I am happy to be able to establish some kind of link with them. I knew Ram Lagai not as well as I would have liked, but certainly I got to know him quite well when I was Vice Chancellor of the University of Baroda between 1981 and 1984. In those days, Baroda didn't have a very well established airport. So we all used to have to come into Ahmedabad and then travel to Delhi. And Ram Lagai was often my fellow passenger on the plane to Delhi and sometimes also when we were returning from Delhi. And we had many long discussions. He was kind enough to invite me to uh, come to Gujarat Vidyapit, which I did from time to time, and we talked about our education, which is why I chose the subject, because that was the bond between us. And we also talked about uh, Mahatma Gandhi and his philosophy. He was, of course, much more sympathetic to Gandhiji than I am, but nevertheless, we had enough in common, and I remember meeting Moraji Bhai Desai, who was then Chancellor uh, at Ramlal, Ramlal Bay's office. But there is one incident which comes to my mind uh, on an occasion like this. I was doing some work on uh, the tradition of public debate in classical India. And I had written to Mahashankar Bhai, who was a good friend of mine, saying I would like to see him. And he said, why don't you come in the morning on such and such a day? And I said, look, I'm coming from Delhi, so I would come to Ahmedabad and I will spend a couple of hours with you. On that flight, Ramlal Bhai was with me. So we got talking and when I landed at Ahmedabad, the discussion was so exciting that instead of going to Mahashankar Bhai's house, which I had promised, <laughs> I ended up going to Ram Lalbhai's house. <laughs> and over a wonderful cup of tea and noisy children, noisy children, we kept talking for about two and a half hours. And then I suddenly realized that I had promised to Vashankar Bhai that I would go and see him. So I told Ram Lalbhai, I said, can I phone to Vashankar Bhai? And in those days, there were no mobile phones, so if they were, they were the preserve of the few. So there was no immediate contact available, so I took a uh, I can't remember, no taxis, I think, very common in those days either. So I took an auto, went to Mahashankar Bay, and he had, he was getting very worried. He thought I had a plane disaster or something had gone wrong. So he had put out a call at Andhavad airport saying, if Bifu Parikh has arrived, please report immediately. <laughs> <laughs> and Mahashankar Bay was a man who could be displaced very easily. Anyway, we had a wonderful morning and that day I took a pledge that the seductive charm of Ramlal Bhai Parikh must be resisted if I'm going to avoid further encounters like this one. So I have very pleasant memories, Mandaven, of, of your very distinguished father. And as I said, it is the higher education that brought us together, and I want to talk about higher education, which worries me greatly. And for the last few years, I have been talking to whoever wants to listen, not in a missionary spirit, but as a concerned citizen, that our higher education is in an extremely sorry state. And we are sleepwalking. We are not doing enough or doing anything at all, really. So, I want to do three things this evening. First of all, I want to show that our higher education is in a poor state. That needs to be established because there are skeptics here who might say, well, we are doing wonderfully well. So what is my evidence? These days we talk about evidence-based medical education, evidence-based this, that, or the other. What is the evidence to show that our higher education is in a mess, is in crisis? Secondly, if you agree with that thesis, and I hope you will, why? Why are we in this mess? And thirdly, is there a way out? What should we be doing? So these are the three things I want to do. And if one part doesn't interest you, you are welcome to go to sleep and get up again when the, when the next part begins. <laughs> so let me start with the facts. 18% of our 18-year-olds 
go to schools, go to colleges or universities, which is a much higher figure than other countries at a similar stage of development, 18%, and this is supposed to rise to 25% by 2017. So that's an important fact to mind, remember. We have got in this country 700 degree awarded institutions and 35,550 colleges. Most of these colleges are substandard and they don't even meet the minimum norms about the number of staff, staff-student ratio, uh, environmental health, infrastructure, toilet facilities and so on. Of these 700 degree awarding institutions, 300 are state universities. 154 are private universities, 129 are deemed universities, 44 are central universities, and 67 are institutions of national importance and university level. So we already have five different kinds of universities, amongst which there is no coordination and no interaction. When we gained independence, there were two and a half lakh students in our universities and colleges. Today, it is 2.4 crores, 100 times more than about 65 years ago. At independence, the teaching staff consisted of 23,500 teachers, lecturers, professors and others, 23,500. Today, it is 9 lakh and 35,000. The, the universities have been springing up in different parts of the country, like mushrooms in monsoon. And these universities don't relate to either the size of the population or the need. For example, UP has 61 universities, 61. Andhra Pradesh has 47, Maharashtra has 45, but Rajasthan, which is not bigger than any of them, has 59 universities, and Gujarat has 43. So you would see how this number of universities come up under popular pressure or politicians' whims, but not in response to any particular need or the size of the population. If you look at the students, that I talked about, 9 lakhs plus uh, 2.3 crores, 86% of them are undergraduates. 86% are undergraduates. 12% are postgraduates. 1% is engaged in research, and only 1% is doing diploma or certificate, which is totally different from Germany or from other European or Western countries. Where right, at the, where right at the beginning, at the age of 18, when you leave school, you have two streams. There are those who are fit to go to higher education and the good, or academically inclined, and there are those who would rather acquire certain skills and go into vocational stream. And, and usually you will find that 15, 20% are in vocational stream. In India, only 1% goes for diploma and certificate. All the rest wants to do arts and science and commerce and spending three years doing degree, not knowing what to do, and naturally utterly unemployable when they graduate. And it's again very striking, where do they go? 37% into arts. And if you look at the subject, which I, if I have the time, I would have told you, which is very disturbing, but 37% of the undergraduates are in arts faculties, about 23% in science faculty, 17% in commerce, 16% in engineering, and 3% in medicine, and 3% in education. That's broadly where people are going. And if you look at those who are going into arts, hardly anyone, or very small percentage, wants to do regional languages, let's say in Gujarat, who wants to do Gujarati language, or Sanskrit, or other Indian languages, or philosophy, 
anthropology. None of the subjects which are concerned with the custody of a civilization seems to attract our students and is completely skewed. This would never happen in England or the United States and France. When bright students would be attracted to English literature, English history, British philosophy, and they will then go on to write about them, or when they become journalists, they already have enough understanding of their own civilization. They are producing people, hardly any of whom have ever studied their own languages, or philosophy, or classical Indian civilization, or whatever. And it's also very striking that the doctoral and postdoctoral research is limited to certain areas and there are large numbers of areas in which no research of any kind is taking place. If you want to follow basic research, for example, in Sanskrit or in Pali or in Ardhavadi or in Buddhist classics, you wouldn't find excellent centers by one or two in India. You will need to go abroad. So what I find disturbing is that the whole way in which our higher education system has grown is biased. Biased in terms of practical utility subjects. Those subjects, those disciplines which are concerned with the quality of a nation's civilization or the quality of life neglected. Class bias, if you look at most of the students, again I don't have the time, mostly upper to middle caste where the lower, lower class, not the word I would like to use, get neglected. Heavy urban bars, very small number coming from rural areas. Happily, the gender bias is not there, so that the number of women going into universities is roughly the same as the number going into uh, the number of men. So that's broadly the general profile of our higher education. Now, what I want to argue that if you look at this structure, the system of higher education that we have built, it's very disappointing. What is my evidence, my first part of my lecture? The evidence is as follows. None of our universities comes amongst the top 200 in the world, or even top 500 according to the latest Times Higher Education and the Shanghai one. The only one that appears from time to time is uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University, but that's largely postgraduate and limited only to social sciences. Compare this with China, whose history is broadly similar. When they became independent two years later, they became a communist country. Compare ourselves with China. Complete disaster of their educational system under cultural revolution. No knowledge of English, extremely limited compared to us. Until 25 years ago, there is not a single Chinese university which was worth talking about. Today, five of the Chinese universities are amongst top 50, and three are amongst top 25 in the world. How did that happen? I'll tell you, how did that happen when I come to the third part of my lecture, what should we be doing? South Korea, something similar happens. Israel, something similar happens. In their cases, decline, decisive intervention, followed by a process of change for the better. In our case, the reverse has happened. None of our universities have installed 200. IITs we talk about a great deal. IITs are nothing but the departure lounge for the United States. And IITs do good teaching. There is not one IIT, and I challenge you to give me evidence, not one IIT which is known for its research. And of the various IITs, the Bombay IIT got high marks, but only because of the quality of teaching, and the quality of teaching is very simple. If you have 50,000 students applying and you choose 500, I mean, one out of a thousand is bound to be a bright student, so you're lucky with your student. 
you are given enormous resources, so the ratio of teacher to student is 1 to 6 or 1 to 7. Intensive teaching, very bright pupils, you train them. So you get high marks for your quality of teaching. But you don't get anything for research. Same thing with IIM. So in terms of research and in terms of international journals and publication, our record is extremely poor. If you look at innovation, patent, again our record is extremely poor. On average, we have had about 12,000 patents compared to 265,000 from China and almost 11,000 from a small country like Israel. If you look at the quality of education, much of our higher education is not higher education, it is further education. University is continuing broadly the same thing that we do at schools. There is a profound difference between higher education and further education. At school, in schools, one is taught chunks of information, chunks of knowledge. Student, children, are, pupils are supposed to absorb those bits of knowledge. What is the theory behind that knowledge? What questions is that knowledge supposed to answer? <coughs> How can you take that knowledge any further? These things are not taught in schools. They are the preserve of the university. So when you come to the university, the quality of education changes. Because education is not concerned now with chunks of information or knowledge. It is concerned with how to think. How to think. How to participate in the process of knowledge. How to build in on that process of knowledge. What questions to ask. So if somebody comes and says, I want to do research, I know that that man is fit for nothing. He is not fit for research. Because if he was fit for research, he wouldn't say, I want to do research. He would come and say, you know, I have been thinking about this and I don't understand why this happens in this way. I have a question. That question is the beginning of research. If you don't have a question to ask, then you simply say, I want to do PhD or I want to do research, nothing happens. And you have a question to ask because you have been taught how to ask questions, how to go about answering them. And if this is what higher education is concerned with, which I think it is, then I think our universities have failed in generating that kind of intellectual curiosities. Even good colleges and universities don't do the sort of thing they should be doing. Now, if you accept this, what I have just said, that in terms of research, and I could give you countless examples. I mean, if you take natural sciences, for example, where I have some interest because two of my sons are professors of natural sciences at Oxford, and I got them to do a little bit of research for me. If you look at high quality research journals in natural sciences, biology, biochemistry, physiology, and others, take eight top journals like Nature, Science, American Journal of Physiology, European Journal of Physiology, Cell, and if you say, how many articles originate in India? How many authors originate in India? Not even one percent. In this top eight journals. How many authors originate in China? And you'll get figures like four percent, five percent, six percent, which is four and a half times better than us. Of course, the Americans and the Europeans would tend to dominate. But then if you ask a different question, and I'll come to that later, how many of them originate in India but are settled abroad? The figure would be something like 10%. So why is it that the same Indians, same mind, writing from within India, produces so little? But when he goes abroad and gets trained and works in the European or American environment, he is not only as good as the natives, is two and a half times better than the indigenous people of England or even Germany or the United States. I'll explain in a minute what happens, why this change. But the important thing to note here is to recognize that in terms of our 
research output, in terms of the quality of our teaching, there is a problem. And the problem is serious. Because if we don't do anything, we'll continue to see more and more of our students going abroad for study, and every year we lose, I think, something like, I may be wrong, six billion dollars spent abroad by our students. They vote with their feet. No use boasting about our higher education, because if so, why don't you send your own children there? If we get a chance, we'll send them to Oxford or Cambridge or Harvard. What does it prove? So for all these reasons, I think there is a serious problem. And in a knowledge-based economy like ours, unless we produce knowledge, unless we work at the frontiers of knowledge, we will remain an economic colony of this or that country. Part of a globalizing world where we are simply condemned to be supplicants, but not playing any kind of active role. So for all those reasons, things need to change. If nothing else, matter of national pride. We are an old civilization, talented people. We ought to be able to do better than what we have done so far. That finishes my part one. I hope I have said enough to convince you that there is a problem. Because very often I find that in India, we generally like to pretend that everything is all right. But if it is not all right, it will be all right. The world is not going to wait unless we wake up fast and do something very quickly. We will be occupying the backwaters of history. And other countries will take a very powerful lead over us and then we panic as we have done throughout our history. If there is a problem, how do we explain this? Why is this happening? And I think there are four or five important reasons why this is happening. First, I think, is the quality of teaching. I must have, I mean, I was a student here at the time of uh, independence. I went to university in 1950. And I think there is an experience I completely wish to forget. I was a student at the most, one of the most prestigious colleges of modern University, St. Xavier's College. My father said, Bhikkhu, you are fit to be a bank clerk. And I was very proud to be a bank clerk. So I did my first degree in economics. There were about 200 students in a class. The chap will come, half of us couldn't listen, so we'll play nuts and crosses. When the exam would come, we didn't have notes, but either we borrowed each other's notes, so there was a guide which we read. Questions were broadly predictable, we regurgitated the same answer, and got an upper second, and a second, if we were lucky, got a first, and that was the end of it. Learned nothing. My, and I have written about it, so I'm not disclosing any secret. My four years at St. Xavier's College were a complete waste of time. Their time as well as mine. When I was a lecturer at Baroda, nothing had changed. Same large classes. And whatever I learned, learned outside the university at the feet of some remarkable individuals. In my case, it was Rajivai Patel, a radical humanist. And we used to go to his house with lots of my friends who are here. And we learned far more. And without him, I wouldn't have been able to cope with my years in England. When I came back as Vice Chancellor of Baroda University 25 years later, I'm sorry to say my good friend Kaimas Mehta and Gaishi Mehta are here. Nothing, actually. And from time to time when I make inquiries now, nothing has changed. It goes on. Now we could have done things differently. I would have said 80 to 8. 90% of the people who go into university are not really interested in university. They are interested in skills. Why don't they have a powerful stream of vocational education? Not in a caste-ridden society like ours, we tend to look down upon vocational education. Let's change the culture so that if you are a carpenter, if you are a plumber, something to be proud of, not to be ashamed of, some go into university, which doesn't make you academic Brahmins or superior, 
you have two strings, there is no undue pressure and you can teach a reasonable body of people in an intelligent manner. So my first difficulty is that the quality of teaching remains extremely poor. And contrast this with one important fact. People used to say, in my days, when I was a vice chancellor, and I suppose rightly, that teachers are poorly paid. The lecturers are poorly paid, so why should they? So bright people are not attracted, which is no longer true. Since 2007, academic salaries in India are one of the highest in the world, allowing for purchasing power parity. If an average Indian's income is 15,000 rupees and the professor gets one lakh, he gets six times the national average. I, as a professor, don't get six times the national average in England. In Germany, the situation is no different. Privat goes on, all professors, the story is nothing, the story is nothing like that. I'm also told, I haven't uh, looked into it very closely, that the average salary, the median, not the average, the median salary in India is two and a half times higher than the medium salary in China. And Chinese education has moved on. So you can't complain about salary. Lecturers are generously paid, they are not overworked. What then is the excuse? So the first thing is, I think the academics need to put their house in order. Secondly, I think, as I said, the quality of students, we need to be doing something about it and redesign the system that those who are fit for further education but not higher education are trained appropriately rather than putting them all into the same basket because they all end up going doing commerce. So that in every university you can imagine, commerce faculty is the seat bed of corruption. <laughs> I'm sorry to say this, but I, I, when I ran the university, that faculty gave me the greatest headache. Largest number of students, like a human body, where one organ is too long, or too large, and controls every other. And that faculty, the problem spreads, and the mediocrity, because these people don't want to learn, they put pressure, so the bright ones are constantly suffering. I think the universities have to be handled properly and the faculties have to be arranged in a certain way so that no single faculty should be allowed to set the tone of others. And in Europe it is very striking. Whenever science faculty is the largest, other things being equal, the quality of the university education is the best. We are commerce faculty and we are the only country, I think there is a separate faculty for commerce because in England I never heard of commerce faculty, in Germany there is no commerce faculty. But if you look at the equivalent of commerce faculty, wherever that faculty is dominant, the quality of education is the lowest because it is a faculty where you put together a number of subjects which no intellectual coherence. You see, in arts faculty you are doing philosophy which is one which trains you to think. Or you are doing history, which gives you a different way of thinking. Or social sciences, a very different way of thinking again. These are all standard disciplines with hundreds of years of history behind them, tradition behind them. Similarly in science, mathematics has a tradition, a way of thinking. Physics has a tradition, chemistry has a tradition. In commerce, what is a tradition? What is thinking? It's the cluster of information. How do you manage? How do you do accounting? How, as you go further, things might be interesting. So that when that particular faculty becomes dominant, it becomes a hotspot. There is no particular form of intellectual inquiry which sets the tone of the university. And I think what we have done is in multi-faculty universities like ours, we have allowed one or two faculties to dominate and set the tone of the rest. The third reason why I think we have done so badly, compared to all, most other countries, has to do with language. Now that's a big issue, and I know that there are emotions run very high, but let me put to you a very simple question. Any great classics, 
I'm talking about English language. If you, I, I belong to the Germanic tradition, the story will be different. But if I want to teach economics, or if I want to teach philosophy, I want to read Adam, take economics, I want to read Adam Smith, I want to read Ricardo, I want to read Karl Marx, hopefully, and I want to read Keynes, Pigou and others. Now these people wrote in English. If you haven't properly mastered English, a first year student or a second year student, what is he going to learn his economics from? He's not going to read Adam Smith because he's lost. He doesn't have access to the language. So Smith, all the great classics are lost to him. Well, he could read them in Gujarati or Hindi. But we haven't translated them. Not one great classic in economics, as far as I know, and I can say with some experience, because I was on Gujarat Grant Board, not one great classic in economics has been translated to Gujarat. Same thing with philosophy. So what is a talented, you meant, I'm not talking about the mediocre student, a talented, bright, inquisitive, ambitious student coming to the university, wanting to read economics or philosophy, Classics are not, a, he must read classics, he must wrestle with great minds, but he has no access to English, and the books are not available in his language. What is he going to do? He depends on his lecturer. He has no other source. A guidebook, of which there are plenty, they are not books really. He depends on his teacher. But the teacher was in the same condition ten years ago. So what does the teacher do? Depends on his teacher. This parampara, this tirthankara, one little tirthankara leading to another. And the story goes on. I faced that when I was a student in 1950s and I saw this when I was a vice chancellor, I see that now. And I think that's a great tragedy. How have other societies coped with it? What did they do in China? Massive! Even during Mao, a massive program of translation of all great classics into Mandarin. Israel, very different attitude. 1948, same history as ours. And what did Israel do? They said... Sorry? No, somebody was... No, I thought there was some second lecture going on or second commentary going on. What did Israel do? They said they would want to teach, revive their own monument language, namely Hebrew, like Sanskrit. And they were so determined to revive Hebrew because that was also their politically it was necessary, because the only language which could be shared by the French Jews and the German Jews and all the others who had settled in Israel, they revived Hebrew so that it's almost like ordinary Israelis talking to each other in the equivalent of Sanskrit fluently, writing books in Sanskrit. So they decided to follow the policy of relying entirely on reviving Hebrew, modernized Hebrew. In our case, I think we have moved from one policy to another. I, in Gujarat, of course, had different language policies, with the result that our students have suffered the most. And the price is there to pay. I remember when I was a vice chancellor, Madhu Singh Bhai once coming to Baroda and saying, Bhikhu Bhai, why is it that no Indian, no Gujarati has ever succeeded or seems to succeed at the All India level? IAS, IFS our people get eliminated in the first round, never called for interview. So we had to set up an IAS, IFS training center in Baroda. And I think after about three years, we managed to get one student across the, past the first round because of language policy. So I think some kind of consistency has to be there, which we didn't have. And the fourth factor why things have gone wrong is that our universities, far more than most other universities, including Chinese, are far too heavily politicized. In China, 
when they wanted to redesign the University of Beijing, the education minister turns to the senior most bureaucrat and says, this university has to be run, I want it to come up, get me the best man. And this chap can approach the retired president of Cornell University and say, will you come and run my university for us? Can you imagine this happening in India? We have, a, and I raised it with the Prime Minister, I can't understand this. We have this policy that you cannot hire a foreigner as an academic. We are the only country in the world which does not advertise academic, until recently, academic vacancies abroad. And I remember one public meeting where Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore once telling me, he said, Professor, tell me, why are you Indians so racist? I said, Prime Minister, I don't understand. He said, 25% of my staff is white. And I'm proud of that. 14% of Chinese staff is white, recruited from abroad. In India, not even one thousandth of one percent, because under the law, you can't advertise abroad. You can't appoint a foreigner. You can have him as a visitor for a while, but you can't have him on a full-time job. So for all these reasons, and if you can't appoint him as a professor, you can't obviously appoint him as a vice-chancellor. Now, why is it that a closed society, a communist society like China, has the confidence to appoint a university president who is, is non-Chinese and use him? Because they know that the country, they might want to make the country great and if you have to employ an outsider for that purpose, you will do that. The remark that Sardar Patel once made, he said, while Jinnah said he will not have Lord Mountbatten as the uh, Governor General of India or whatever, of Pakistan, Nehru and Sardar said, we will have him because he has created a mess. We want him to stay on and clear it up. Why can't we do that? So I think we have allowed ourselves to be so heavily politicized. Every vice chancellor appointed by the chief minister or whatever, making sure he belongs to the right party. All this, I think, has allowed our universities to become a cockpit. Not all universities, but most universities, cockpit of politics. With the result that we haven't created the right kind of environment. I'm not mentioning cultural factors, which are just as important. In a university department, if there's a bright student, and I used to see that as my chancellor, as well as a young lecturer, if somebody is coming up and doing some interesting work, the head of the department or others might feel jealous, try to put him down, and that kind of leg pulling goes on as well. As a result of all that, there is not the space, the environment, the air that a talent needs to breathe and to blossom. Finally, the last, come to the last part, ten more minutes, what should we be doing? Well, if I knew the answer, I would have patented it a long time ago. But I do have a few thoughts, and I have raised it again and again with a number of people. I have raised it with the Prime Minister, I have also raised it with uh, people in power, uh, here and elsewhere. And some action is being done somewhere, in other places nothing is happening. But I think ultimately this is the direction in which we will have to go. And there are half a dozen suggestions I want to make, and then I shall stop. First, I think we have to redesign the entire system of university of higher education and make sure that we have two streams, the vocational one and an academic one. Making sure that neither is looked down upon as somehow inferior, which can easily happen in a caste-ridden society like ours, that the academic stream might be seen as the Brahmins and the other might be seen as the Shudras. I think that cultural change, but it will come, it's coming, but that kind of streaming is absolutely necessary to keep the university free from this pressure and to make sure that kids who go to vocational are not forced to do degrees like arts and commerce and others in which they have no interest, but they go there only because they have no alternative. I think the second thing has to be done is in these days, and here Sam Pitroda I think made a good suggestion, I take it in a slightly different direction, but his suggestion is the right one. 
Our pedagogy can be totally transformed through technology. Take a very simple idea. You have a Nobel laureate at Harvard. Think of a Nobel laureate at Harvard in physiology giving first year lectures in physiology. Same lectures can be broadcast all over the world in every classroom in Gujarat or <coughs> Maharashtra or wherever by simply using the same technology, videoing this man's lecture, and students can sit in a hall, listen to the lecture. They will be exposed to the very best in the world, and lecturers here will be freed from having to copy out their teachers and continue in those lectures. And they, they would then tell them, you, are, you don't have to spend six, seven hours giving lectures. They will be provided by technology, by the Nobel laureates of the world. But what we want you to do is, this classroom will be broken up into groups of five, four, five, six students. And you spend so many hours a week interacting with this small group. That is the strength of Oxford, this is the strength of Cambridge, this is the strength of Harvard. When I was at Harvard, I mean, apart from giving lectures, which were optional, but the most important thing was so many hours spent tutoring two students. You will assign them an essay, the student will write it, he will come and read it to you, and you spend one hour just going through his essay line by line. When I was a student at LSE, something similar happened. When my three boys went to Oxford, right from the beginning, it is this small tutorial teaching, one-to-one. -one. Not even two students, one student spending one hour with his lecturer for full 50 minutes just discussing a particular subject, week after week after week. Imagine what it can do to you. And even in a large country like ours, we have nine lakh teachers. If you release them from having to give lectures, they are free for this one-to-one -one kind of encounter. And imagine how profoundly you can train your students. I think the third thing we need to be doing is for postgraduate teaching or postgraduate research, I think we should be looking increasingly at the German model. And since Ravindra is here, it's very striking that if you look at top 100 universities in the world, German universities don't appear. And the question is why? Why like us? German universities don't appear. Is it because they're like us? No. That is because in Germany, unless I'm totally mistaken, the really creative research takes place at Max Planck Institute. So, Max, for example, they really they recently decided to do two things. The German government said, look, we must have a center for the study of race relations and anthropology. So they set up a Max Planck Institute, set aside 50 million marks or whatever, Deutsche marks. We'll set up this center and a friend of mine, Steve Wertowick, was appointed director of Max Planck Institute. And that is the center where all the race relations research is being systematically done. Three years ago, they decided to same, do the same with India. They said, we want to set up a, study, a center for the study of law and politics in India, law and governance, law and politics in India. And invited a prominent Indian, Upendra Bakshi was there, he spent two years setting up the center, Max Planck Institute. So universities are there, but these are the centers of excellence. I think we start with something like this, because in my days we certainly used to have case, center for the advanced study in education, let's say in Barrow University, other advanced centers in other places, I'm sure it still exist. I think we need to be thinking like that, so that rather than dissipate waste of resources, we are able to concentrate them in certain areas. Two other points, we have what, um, six or seven points of advice for anybody who wants to listen, but I'll just mention two, because I've gone on too long. I think the other thing that the Chinese did, the other thing that Israel has done, and what we ought to be doing is this. It shouldn't be too difficult. If, for example, take this, something like Gujarat, 
if we identify and say, look, every year we will take 25 highly talented, bright students through exam or through whatever. Two in philosophy, two in economics, two in physics, two in chemistry, two in something else. And at the state expense, send them abroad, Oxford or Cambridge or Harvard, get them trained, they come back, they set up departments, and like one line light in another, they will then go on to train students. One kind of Chinese have done that and from about 1984. They negotiated with great universities in the West and said, look, every year we'll send you 200 students. 10 philosophy, 10 economics, 10 this, you train them. Three years later they come back, how much? For each student you charge 22,000 pounds. Well, we are going to do wholesale, 200 students, how much? So knock down the price. Very Chinese way of doing it. We Gujarati should be able to do it even better. So 20,000 comes to 10,000. All right, 10,000 pounds per student, 200,000. Five, five years down the line, the difference is striking. Every year you have got 200 students coming back fully trained at great universities prepared to go. They do not tolerate nonsense that goes on. They demand changes. Plus, they fire students. Plus, put them in contact with the professors with whom they have studied. You can see the change. Likewise, with postdoctoral training, if you can't do it for all, let them do their PhD here, and then they can go and spend eight months, nine months at great universities, discussing their work, submitting papers, presenting seminar papers. Summer school is something another one that Singapore and South Korea have done. You get an extremely eminent man from abroad, a senior professor, and say, will you come to a team of two or three? Let's take again my own subject philosophy, choose three people, great eminence, and say, will you come to India and run a summer school for four weeks? During those four weeks, we'll have 30 people, 30 junior faculty, in their mid-thirties, carefully chosen, who will spend four weeks with you from nine in the morning till six in the evening, reading things that you have assigned them, writing essays, commenting, one-to-one -one discussion, one month of training. At the hands of three of the finest minds, and the change in Singapore and South Korea over a period of years, you build up a momentum has been profound. So the point simply is there is no shortage of ideas if only we put our mind to it and the question is we don't put our mind to it and that's the problem. There is no shortage of answers and I want to end simply by uh, returning to the point I started with. I remember what I said that if you look at the high quality articles in high quality journals Authors from India would be not even 1%, but authors with Indian names settled, trained and settled abroad would be a very large number. What has happened? I quoted the remark at the press conference by Gandhiji, which I thought was very interesting. Gandhiji said that any Indian who has profoundly changed India in modern times had two qualities. He was always educated abroad, but he was always rooted in India. Either alone is not enough. Gandhiji was one example in a temple, Sadar Patel, Nehru. You are exposed to the best in the West, but without losing your contact with your own tradition, so that you are able to interpret, translate it in the idioms familiar to your people and change them. My own feeling is that if you look at all of half a dozen Nobel laureates, every one was trained and settled and settled abroad, whether it is Sen, whether it is Kurama, whether it is whatever. You can go through the list. Raman is not an exception because he also has spent a lot of time before. There is nothing to be ashamed about it. These guys had to start over us. 
Their universities have been going on for 800 years. The first one started in 1320. In Bologna, then in Paris, then in Oxford. They have a good start over us. And we want to go and learn from them and then build up our own tradition of scientific learning. How long have we had universities? We never had tradition of research in universities. The British wouldn't allow it. They wanted to produce clients. It's only after independence that Panditji thought about it, saying, look, this is this crucial, and he went for the big things, IITs and IIMs and National uh, Physics Laboratory and Chemistry Laboratory, and without Panditji's great initiative, India would be dead. We owe him far more than we appreciate, with all of his mistakes. The man had a vision, the man loved the country, and he went on to achieve certain things. That vision, that love, for the country is absent, and in that absence, we are in a mess. So what I'm saying is, if you now compare, Indians settled here, Indians here, not being able to produce international quality, world quality research, but the same people with the same intelligence, trained abroad, working in the foreign environment, something happens, and they outpace, do even better than the locals. How does this happen? Not a shortage of intelligence. It happens for four factors. And I have observed it closely. First, I think there is pressure. You can't get promoted simply by seniority. And for me, in order to be a professor, I had to write books which had to be published by serious universities like Oxford or Cambridge or Harvard which had to be reviewed in critical journal before they would even consider you. Yeah? I should tell the story, you know it. What is the system of incentives and sanctions? Then they should not be arbitrary. The head of the department or the vice chancellor should not be able to decide your future. A system should be in place, but a system which constantly encourages you to do even better. We need a system. This is what happens when people go abroad. They are trained to think, which they were not trained to do here. There is a system of incentives and sanctions. There is an institutional environment. You walk into your office, as I used to do, and there are your colleagues, and they will say, have you seen this article by so-and-so? You know that so-and-so has come out with this theory in philosophy, or so much so has shown that Karl Marx was wrong, or that his economic and philosophic manuscripts were not published in that order. From the moment you go, there is this constant talking, discussing, sharing academic information, academic ideas, over coffee, over tea, and you say to yourself, look, I can't be a dumb fellow there, what am I contributing to it? So there is a stimulating environment, and most important of all, just as every profession has an ethic, medical profession has an ethic, and you would say, as a doctor, I can't do this. It will be dishonest. You take Hippocratic oath. Likewise, as an academic, you internalize certain norms. And the most important norm that which I had to internalize, and a lot of people have done is, if you are an academic, you say to yourself, I'm not a transmitter belt. I'm not going to take over my professor notes and pass on to some, my student. As an academic, my job is to contribute to the growing process of knowledge. I can't be a hawker or a shopkeeper. I want to produce something, and I can't respect myself unless I have produced some original idea within the limits of my capacity. Otherwise, I can't respect myself. That kind of internalization of professional norm, when that happens, that's when the culture has changed and things will begin to change. But as I say, that is a gigantic step, and to get there, several small steps have to be taken, and I have suggested what they are. All you need is love of your country, some kind of commitment, and determination to do something. Thank you very much, Madam. Thanks again for inviting me. Being from silence, Mr. Holman. Yeah, now I'm going to go for a solo.